Today with today's update on coronavirus disease in Australia. I'll just wait for the phone to stop talking at us. There's a few journalists online today uh, on the line. So the numbers for coronavirus disease in Australia today. Uh, thus far we have diagnosed 21,084 individuals in Australia with COVID-19. Uh, in the 24 hours to 12 noon today, 404 newly confirmed cases. In New South Wales, uh, there were 10 new cases reported. One was overseas acquired in hotel quarantine. Seven were contacts of a confirmed case. Two were locally acquired and the contact has not been identified and are still under investigation. In Victoria, 394 new cases were reported in the past 24 hours. 49 were contacts of a confirmed case. 345 remain under investigation. There were 17 more deaths overnight uh, from COVID-19, uh, bringing the total number of deaths nationally to 295. 658 people are hospitalised at the moment and 51 of those are in intensive care units. On Friday, the National Cabinet considered Australia's, uh, the Australian Government's vaccine and treatment strategic approach for COVID-19. This was a critical uh, document uh, and is a critical document developed by the Commonwealth Department of Health in partnership with other agencies. It demonstrates the need uh, during this COVID-19 epidemic uh, to not only focus on the now, and there are clearly things that we need to achieve now, uh, both in Victoria and in other states around Australia to bring the epidemic uh, uh, under good control. But importantly, we also need to plan for the medium and the long term. And clearly one of those important planning elements is how we acquire, procure, manufacture, roll out a vaccine. The strategic approach that was presented to National Cabinet is focused on these main domains, research and development, purchase and manufacturing, international partnerships, the crucially important element uh, for immunisation of regulation and safety, particularly when we're talking about a novel vaccine for a novel pandemic strain virus and administration of immunisation and monitoring uh, thereafter. The Commonwealth is, is well placed and well advanced in a number of areas, including advanced purchasing agreements, including manufacturing agreements, and uh, more broadly, international and multilateral agreements, which are critically important because they are going to support and facilitate access not only for Australia, but also for our partners in the region. Australia uh, is committed to ensuring that there is equitable access to a COVID-19 vaccine around the world. And that point was made very strongly by Prime Minister Morrison and Chief Medical Officer Paul Kelly at their press conference on Friday. And it's important that we reiterate that. Uh, it is uh, not going to be acceptable for any single country to have the vaccine. Um, and Australia is joining with a number of different other countries around the world um, through uh, the uh, Gavi initiative uh, to ensure that uh, any vaccine that is developed is, is available. In the Australian context, we have a number of vaccine candidates that are actually under human trials in Australia at the moment. One of them is from the University of Queensland. Uh, one of them has been developed by uh, Flinders University and the Adelaide Company Vaccine. And two of them have been developed by international companies, Novavax and Clover. It's very exciting, uh, the pace with which a vaccine is being developed for COVID-19. Clearly at the moment, uh, we have only blunt tools to rely on to control the virus, tools like extreme social distancing and the stage four restrictions that are in place down in Victoria at the moment. Uh, it reminds us um, that around Australia, uh, we need to, even in places that have no COVID-19, in the absence of a vaccine, as we prepare, uh, as we trial vaccines, as we prepare uh, for the possibility of a vaccine, we must at the same time keep our distance. We must at the same time get ourselves swabbed and tested if we're at all unwell and stay away um, from our colleagues, co-workers or schoolmates if we're unwell. Uh, we must continue our excellent hygiene practices that we've developed as a nation. Uh, and we must continue um, to encourage uh, our friends and family, 
I saw reports today um, that there are clearly members of the community that do not engage in uh, traditional media or even social media. Um, there are doubtless many millions of Australians that don't necessarily go uh, to Nick Coatsworth press conferences on a Sunday afternoon. Um, but with one or two degrees of separation um, and uh, the community engagement. Um, so for example, if you are a um, mother or a father whose um, teenager or 20 year old um, doesn't appear to be getting the message, um, then now's of course the time um, to encourage them. We have to as a community all be moving in the same direction here and there is nowhere that's more important in that regard than down in Victoria at the moment. Um, and again, as we will do every single day uh, when Victoria, um, Greater Melbourne and Mitchell Shire are under stage four restrictions and the remainder of Victoria is under stage three restrictions, um, we acknowledge um, the challenges, um, the disruption um, to, your li to their lives that Victorians are undergoing at the moment, essentially for the benefit of Victoria and the, the broader Australian community. What Victorians are doing at the moment is for all of us. And um, so if you know anyone in Victoria, um, as I do, uh, just pick up the phone, check in, check in how they're going, um, give them your support. Um, sometimes that phone call is uh, what brightens an otherwise, um, an otherwise dull day. Um, and just check in on how your friends and family and colleagues are going on down in Victoria. And with that, I'll take some questions. Claire. Can you talk about the blunt instruments we have to control the virus, but there's also been improvements in treatments. The death rate now is a lot lower than the initial estimates even a few months ago. Where is it at in terms of what Australia believes to be an accurate death rate? And what are the factors in treatment specifically that you think are helping to lower that? Well, Claire, I haven't seen the latest mortality rates for COVID-19 over the past two or three weeks. Uh, but it is the case that Australian results appear to be better than around the world and there's a, a number of reasons for that. The first one is of course that our intensive care units, our doctors and nurses in our ICUs have always been world leading. And that doesn't just apply to intensive care but it also applies across the range of our healthcare system, whether it's in primary care, whether we're talking about nurse practitioners, whether we're talking about uh, those brave doctors and nurses at the front of shop down in ED's emergency departments in Victoria at the moment um, who really don't know what's coming through the door uh, at any, any given time. So um, the quality of our healthcare system is important. Uh, but moreover, we're learning more and more. We're applying new treatments. We're applying dexamethasone, which is the steroid that's been demonstrated in the recovery trial to actually decrease mortality. We have at our disposal remdesivir, which um, shortens length of stay for a certain uh, group of patients, and there's more evidence on the way for that. We have our intensive care specialists who are um, backed up by a national network of communication through the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care Society, who are actually discussing on a daily basis the clinical treatment of patients who are gravely ill with COVID-19. How you ventilate them in particular has been uh, a challenge and this concept of proning when you actually ventilate someone on their, uh, on their tummy rather than on their back um, has proven to be a critically important thing. But the timing that you do that, the timing that you intubate someone, and I guess the complexity of the answer demonstrates that um, there are so many things that are going into this. Um, there's certainly no one thing, um, but I think um, the one thing that we should remember is that the capacity of Australia's health system, including Victoria's health system at the moment, to manage uh, even um, uh, the number of COVID-19 cases in, in Victoria at the moment is sufficient that people have access to the care when they need it. And I think if I uh, wanted to pick any difference between Australia and uh, some of those countries that suffered so badly under the first wave, that would be it. Richard. Um. Dr. Coursework, how many, is there any update on how many cases have been using, or well, investigations have been using the COVID Safe app? The Prime Minister said that it's been quite successful in New South Wales recently with their community transmission. Yes, so COVID Safe has had a number of recent and, and notable successes. I guess the most significant one was the identification not just of uh, some contacts, but of an entire transmission event, so to speak, um, that wasn't uh, identified through the contact tracing interview. And that involved uh, some 544 
uh, contacts in the west of, of Sydney being, uh, being identified through the app, and of those, uh, two of those tested positive in the short space of time afterwards. I don't have any updates whether there's been any more after that. Uh, subsequently, that there have been some more modest numbers of uh, uh, contacts detected with COVID safe that were not detected with, uh, with the interviews and, uh, the, that are going on. In Victoria at the moment, uh, so we know that the COVID safe app is functioning because when it's unlocked, it's detecting contacts. Um, but once again in Victoria, it appears that because COVID safe has been reintroduced at a time of lockdown and people are more aware of the number of uh, who they've been in contact with, in Victoria, it is uh, once again not revealing any new contacts as far as I know that otherwise wouldn't have been identified. Um, so why is that the case, that we've suddenly gone from an app that appeared not to be working um, to one that is? Well, the first thing to say is the app was always uh, letting off its digital signals and pinging. Um, there have been um, updates and improvements to the algorithms that um, the Digital um, Transformation Agency will, would be able to describe more fully, um, but that has undoubtedly had an effect. Uh, and then finally, we see what happens when you have a, a, an essentially open economy, um, as you do in New South Wales, and that's where COVID Safe comes into its own, because that's where you're in touch with people who are strangers, um, potentially for prolonged periods of time, and it's very difficult to identify who you were in touch with in the past 14 days. So my encouragement to all Australians uh, at the end of um, the response to that question is, uh, we've had close to potentially even over 7 million downloads or close to it. Um, uh, it's not just the downloads. We want that application activated on your phones. So if, it, if you've got an iPhone, if you've got an Android, if you've downloaded the app, um, get on it right now and activate it. And once again, if, you, um, if you've got children, if you've got teenagers, young adults, encourage them to download and activate as well. Claire. With regards to New South Wales being more open, an issue that's emerging is venues are saying that their responsibility for people's social distancing only really starts once people are inside the venue and they're not able to police. Uh, we've seen people crowding and not social distancing while lining up outside venues. What is your uh, advice? Has the HPPC given any recommendation about wh whose responsibility that becomes? And I guess what, to what extent is it actually personal responsibility of those individuals who aren't social, distan social distancing? Well, Claire, we, we won't get down as the HPPC into the detail of, of what individual jurisdictions do with their venues. But I think a, a general response is that it's always a combined responsibility. So uh, whilst a, a venue may say, uh, and they may be correct in saying that uh, they, they can't control what people do outside their venue, um, they uh, nonetheless would have a, make a very good demonstration of being COVID safe uh, and therefore more attractive to their customers, I would have thought, if they actually did uh, ensure social distancing. So uh, I, I, I don't run a pub or a club, um, but if I did, I'd be making very sure um, that on the way in people were socially distancing and, and outside on the pavement. On an individual level, of course, uh, I mean, if, if you're standing closer than one arm's length to someone as you're trying to um, get into a venue, you're too close. And, and the final thing is, if you go somewhere, and this, this was one of the best quotes I heard out of the Crossroads Hotel outbreak, which was um, a patron that went in and said, we, we looked at it, we thought it wasn't safe, and we went in anyway, and we wish we hadn't. Um, so if you go into a venue in New South Wales um, at the moment, and, and you think it's not COVID safe, find a venue that is COVID safe. Uh, Dr. Cotsworth, the, um, the average, the seven-day average of the cases in Victoria seems to have dipped below 500. Is, is this a positive sign that the effects of lockdown are finally beginning to be seen, or are we still going to have to wait at least two weeks before we know if stage four is working? I think, I think the challenging thing about COVID, of course, is that you never really know where you are on the co curve. Um, where can we be relatively confident of where Victoria is? We know that the basic reproductive number is one or just below one, and we heard that from Professor Sutton over the past couple of days, uh, and that certainly accords with the, model, the federal modelling of the Victorian epidemic. So it appears that we're on the plateau. What we're looking for is the inflection point um, that tells Victorians 
uh, that their efforts are being rewarded, um, that we, uh, we see numbers going down. And we haven't seen that yet, uh, but I have no doubt that we will see it. I mean, if you consider that stage three restrictions um, had us at a, a, a sort of almost at a plateau, um, then these stage four restrictions will produce a result. Um, it, the, the extent of that result really depends on how low that reproductive number can be bought um, and that the, um, the ideal situation would be if we could see that reproductive number at 0 0.5. We don't have enough data at the moment from the numbers to see whether that's approaching 0 0.5, um, but in the coming days to week, to, to week we will see that. To your knowledge with the vaccines, you mentioned that there's positive signs of human tech trials in Australia. Um, as these companies start approaching Australians to be involved in these trials, what if someone is approached, what should they be considering before they potentially say yes, or what are some of the, I guess, recommendations around human trials at this early stage? Well, I, I mean, I think that's an excellent question because there are people being approached um, to be in human trials in Australia and, uh, and um, there are already people who have had the vaccine. And I think as a general rule, whether you're involved in a COVID-19 vaccine trial or whether you're involved in the trial of a new medicine, uh, often Australians get approached when they're in hospital to, to um, be on novel medicines or when they have um, severe illnesses such as cancer or or um, other um, or blood disorders like leukaemia. Uh, but for whatever reason, any of those, the most important thing is to uh, deliver informed consent. Um, and informed consent means um, that you get as much information as you can um, about that, uh, um, uh, that medication or that vaccine, excepting, of course, that the reason you're on a trial is because we don't know everything about it. So um, uh, I, would, I would say um, that the companies that I've mentioned that are trialling the vaccines and the academic institutions, um, these are um, clearly reputable institutions. We have um, allowed them to perform the trials in Australia, which is governed um, by a very rigorous research architecture. Um, and so with that in mind, um, uh, that should uh, provide people with reassurance about being on human trials for COVID vaccines. And I might just go to the phones. I'll just pick one up. Sorry to move off camera there. Yes, hello. Josh. Hello, yeah. I'll go with Josh first, sorry. Hi, th thank you very much, Doctor. Um, on mental health, um, Victoria uh, officials revealed today that uh, presentations with emergency departments for self-harm and acute mental health issues had spiked um, this year compared to this time last year, um, most notably for people under the age of 18. Um, are you aware of any national data on that at this point? Obviously, it's a uh, you know, in-progress sort of issue, but or are there any other statistics that you could sort of share around that sort of um, issue and I guess on a related note um, why do you think specifically there has been such a spike in younger people specifically presenting um, with, these, with these issues in Victoria? Well Josh I'm not aware of uh, more broad national data that's that's demonstrated a, a spike uh, but that's that's certainly something that I'll, I'll take on board. I, I think that the answer to the question lies in we were aware that the second range, second uh, round of restrictions, wherever they occurred in Australia, were going to um, result in a, a more severe impact than the first, whether that was a social impact, an economic impact, or indeed a mental health impact. Uh, I think, you know, for those of us who aren't in Victoria at the moment, it's actually really difficult to imagine um, how challenging this is. Um, having been sensitised to it in the first wave, um, to then be in a situation that, we, that you have to go through it again, uh, and then some in those areas that have stage four restrictions, is going to um, produce uh, a whole range of, of undesirable effects, and one of those is, is, is clearly um, in the mental health space. So I think the question needs to be, what can we do about it? Um, and, and, and once again, this is a multi-layered approach. What can government do about it? I understand Premier Andrews announced $60 million worth of additional funding today for um, Victorians' mental health. Um, the federal programs have been up and running for many, many months now, and Prime Minister Morrison announced an extra $12 million. 
Um, it's not simply about making these announcements, of course, the governments um, can provide the services, but it also requires people to access them. So how do you access mental health services? It can be through the internet, um, the Black Dog Institute, of course, Beyond Blue, some of these really famous names now in mental health, because there has been a, a deep focus on mental health in the Australian community over the, um, uh, over the past decade. And then the critical and crucial role of your general practitioner, speaking from um, personal experience, the experience of others, uh, the general practitioner is a fantastic resource if you have any sort of concerns about your own mental health um, and, that, and they're your, um, your port of call. And of course there are some people who won't be accessing those and the people that we are most concerned about are the people who either haven't recognised um, the mental health um, consequences of, uh, of the, for themselves or people that don't know how to access services or are afraid of accessing services. Um, and for those, again, I'll go back to what I, start, I said at the start of the press conference, that's where community has to be part of this. That's where friends and family have to observe changes in people and reach out and be aware that those services are there. Um, and remember um, the uh, urgent um, uh, numbers uh, of Lifeline and Kids Helpline um, which are widely available uh, to be able to seek the sort of urgent attention um, if, uh, if you do find yourself in a mental health crisis. Um, and uh, also, of course, not the first line, but the last line, as you've said, Josh, emergency departments as well. Um, but there are a whole range of ways to, um, to, to, to help manage that, and it is a, an, a, a considerable focus um, of the federal and state governments at the moment. And I'll just go to the... Jane Norman, yes. Hi, Dr Hopesworth. Thanks for um, taking these questions. I'm just picking up on the youth mental health um, angle again. Um, obviously, younger people haven't been as badly affected by COVID-19 as elderly Australians, but I'm just wondering what you think will be the kind of longer-lasting harm. There's been a big focus on particularly Year 12 students, um, those studying first year uni. Yeah, what, what kind of psychological effects do you think could be the legacy of this COVID-19? Well, I think the first thing to say is that it, 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 your question, Jane, is a really good opportunity to move away from um, simply the hospitalisations and death rates as the consequences of COVID-19. Um, Clearly, you don't have to get COVID-19 to be affected by COVID-19. Um, you might lose your job because of COVID-19. You might develop um, a new um, uh, mental health issue because of COVID-19. Um, you might be socially or economically affected by COVID-19. There are a whole range of, of issues. It is, this is not simply what happens at the pointy end, of, of course. Um, I think... You know, it's very hard to speculate on what might happen to um, a whole, say, generation of Year 12s, uh, and, and um, that's certainly a focus for education ministries around Australia, in, including um, Victoria at the moment, what to do with, with VCE students. Um, but there are a number of ways that um, people are supporting uh, students, and that's, that's whilst that's slightly beyond the health realm, uh, I'm aware um, that that there's a, there's a high degree of awareness of the need to support students either at university or at secondary school level. Um, so uh, once again, we recognise that there's a whole range of um, COVID-related, uh, not necessarily um, the disease itself, but uh, out and negative outcomes. Um, and it's critically important that we're on top of them just as much as we are on top of the disease itself. Richard. Oh. Oh, sorry, I think Tamsin's on the line as well. Um, last week, uh, the National Cabinet met and was um, Professor Kelly said that they were talking about P2 and N95 masks and preventing further infections in healthcare workers. I was just wondering if you had an update on that. And then also, I understand that a lot of work is being done and there's going to be a report to the Victorian response to COVID-19, specifically looking at aged care. I was just wondering at this stage if there were any learnings from Victoria that were already being implemented in other states to prevent further devastation like we've seen in Victoria. Okay, thanks Tamsin. So firstly on the P2N95 um, respirator use and the guidance therein. So th this relates to whether um, we think that the predominant mode of transmission for COVID-19, a respiratory virus, is via what we call contact or droplet, um, where 
very large particles come out of the mouth and are deposited on surfaces uh, and then um, you acquire it through contact with mucous membranes or whether there might be an airborne transmission component. Now, traditionally, airborne diseases like measles, varicella, which is chickenpox, or tuberculosis, um, these diseases are transmitted, their infected particles stay suspended in the air for many hours after um, someone, they come out of someone's respiratory tract. So um, to simplify that a little bit, it is, it is clear um, that for respiratory virus, a new paradigm is emerging, that there is a continuum between contact and droplet and what we would say is traditional airborne transmission. Um, so in recognition of that, um, but more importantly, in recognition of some specific cases that happened in Melbourne um, at one of the major tertiary hospitals, and those cases actually involved very experienced infectious disease clinicians and registrars who were um, using standard PPE, including a surgical mask, and still acquired COVID-19. In recognition of that, the circumstances under which P2 uh, N95 respirators, which protect, protect you from airborne particles, has been expanded by both the, the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services and also by the Infection Control Expert Group. Specifically, uh, in instances where COVID-19 patients are hospitalised or in um, residential aged care, uh, where the environment is uncontrolled. Um, so COVID-19 wards where people can deteriorate or they might be on what we call high flow oxygen that can aerosolise COVID-19, uh, people should be wearing N95 uh, P2 masks. So that guidance from ICAG is actually on the Infection Control Expert Group, is on their website, and the guidance from the Victorian DHHS is, uh, is on their website as well. Just finally to re reiterate that that uh, updated guidance was in direct response to um, uh, talking to frontline clinicians, uh, frontline infectious disease physicians in Melbourne about uh, the uh, transmission dynamics of COVID-19. Um, now on the second question, which was residential aged care and the learnings uh, that were presented to National Cabinet. So I'll give one or two examples um, of instances where those learnings are already being implemented around Australia. Uh, one of them is the communication that's required between the residential aged care sector, which as you know is um, uh, a Commonwealth funded and regulated um, and, uh, and largely run by private pr providers. So communication with that um, sector and the hospitals and health systems which are state run. Um, so the, the critical planning between those two sectors um, in states around Australia is going on as we speak. That was something that was discussed at the AHPPC last week um, and all Chief Health Officers are very well aware of the need for that ongoing, ongoing planning. So there were a number of other um, examples in that, in that document, um, but uh, on, on a number of levels, Chief Health Officers are taking um, a forward-leaning stance, a very forward-leaning stance. From the um, Commonwealth perspective, of course, we've had um, over 100,000 people uh, trained in uh, infection prevention control. Um, we're reviewing the current infection prevention control guidance. Uh, the Commonwealth regulator, um, Janet Anderson, has a, um, uh, is reviewing infection prevention control guidance and precisely um, what uh, she will be doing to make sure that providers are ensuring that their staff are up to date on, on that critical aspect, that critical aspect of control within aged care facilities, um, which is making sure it's not spread um, through the use, um, through the appropriate use of personal protective equipment. I'll take two more questions from Richard and um, Claire. Uh, doctor, are you particularly concerned about the number of healthcare workers getting infected at work in Victoria and the effect that that might have on the overall hospital system to deal with the second wave? So, uh, on on one level, I'm very concerned about the number of healthcare worker infections. Yes, um, when we hear that. I think it was 140 out of 459 yes, yesterday were either residential aged care workers or, or health care workers. That is very concerning. Um, that clearly has flow on effects um, to the workforce and um, it, is, uh, it is certainly putting strain on uh, individual health services. We're aware of that um, in Victoria. What is clear though is that despite that strain, um, 
the system is coping in Victoria with the current number of cases, as I said, about 650 hospitalisations and 51 people in intensive care. And that's remained relatively static um, since, the, um, since the second wave uh, started in Victoria. So um, the, the key, of course, is to take healthcare workers' infections on three levels. The first one is... Um, if there isn't the degree of community transmission, there won't be healthcare worker infections. And that's how the community is helping reduce that number. Number two is what the individual healthcare workers and, and um, employers can do to prevent healthcare worker to healthcare worker transmission, which is likely to be a significant part of this. And thirdly, of course, personal protective equipment, which we just discussed with N95 P2 masks. Information is key. Um, it's very difficult um, for our colleagues to hear when all we can say to them is 140 healthcare workers and residential aged care workers got an infection, we have to work towards being able to provide more information about how that um, is uh, being acquired. That is certainly a priority for me. I know it's a priority for my colleagues down in Victoria as well. It's challenging when you have so many, um, but the more, um, the, the deeper the information, the more we can share with frontline healthcare workers, um, the, uh, the more, more trust we build um, and the easier it is um, for them. Dr. Goodworth, a month since the crossroads outbreak almost, New South Wales is still reporting one or two cases of unknown origin a day. Are you concerned that that figure has been maintained, it hasn't gone down, is it where you'd expect it to be and what would you hope would happen that those investigations are eventually eliminated? Where's New South Wales looking in terms of a second wave? Well look, uh, I Clearly with, with sort of 10 to um, 15, occasionally 20 infections a day, um, that, that is, is not a second wave in, in New South Wales. What we would all like to see, and what I'm sure um, Chief Health Officer Kerry Chant would like to see, is uh, those numbers dwindling away. Um, they're not at the moment. Um, that suggests that um, whilst the chains of transmission are being brought under control, there are still um, one or two instances where um, there's onward transmission of COVID-19 within the community in New South Wales. The, the fact that in a city of 7 million um, or, or so, it, we've been able to, or New South Wales have kept this under control um, uh, for this uh, length of time is just an exceptional public health um, response. There's no doubt about that. Um, but um, like, uh, like Dr Chant, uh, all of us at the HPPC would like to see those numbers going down. Thank you very much.